You know what I really, really want to do <laughs> is talk to the people who signed this paper and um, just have a little meeting and just say, let's do something. Who's willing to do what? When should we get together? Um, let's act. That's what I really want to do. Um, maybe there will be a couple of minutes before I have to leave. If anybody is re really wanting to be active and really thinks that the idea of the letter to Trump or from Canada or from us, if they, if they really want to do that, then maybe we can just go over there, the few who are willing to act. Um, so Keith, you were late, I think, were you? So I, th some people have signed in on, um, to give their emails out so that they can learn about uh, the next um, event that some of us are, are, are supporting, which has to do with the story of Okinawa. So anyway, reading. Uh, there's a prologue in the beginning of Obasan. I'll see if I can remember it. <coughs> there is a silence that cannot speak. There is a silence that will not speak. Beneath the grass, the speaking dreams, and beneath the dreams is a sensate sea. The speech that frees comes forth from that amniotic deep. To attend its voice, I can hear it say, is to embrace its absence, but I fail the task. The word is stone. I admit it. I hate the stone. I hate the sealed vault with its cold icon. I hate the staring into the night, the questions thinning into space, the sky swallowing the echoes. If I could follow the stream down and down to the hidden voice, would I come at last to the freeing word? I ask the night sky, but the silence is absent. The silence is steadfast. There is no reply. Now, I wrote that in 1980 or so, when I thought that there is no reply to the question of evil in the world. There's no reply to these endless questions we seek about meaning, about why we're here, about what can be done, how we can possibly exist in this impossible place where we have to kill what we love to eat and survive. How crazy is that? How paradoxical is that? What is the answer to all of these things? And there was no reply. People would say after the Holocaust, there is no reply to these big questions. Evil just is. And even to try to think that there is any meaning to it is heinous. You don't look for meaning anymore because there is none, and that was the answer, and that was never satisfied me. So what I want to say is that all these years later, I have come to the word, I have come to the reply. The freeing word is here in this book. And my life has been turned around. I can say this, these years of my old age are the best years of my life. I have a strong sense of meaning and purpose and direction. There is an ethic for our time that we can live by. I don't think we have anything left right now except that we love each other. And I think we need to forgive each other. And some people say, what? You know, you don't forgive all these atrocities and things. And I think if we don't forgive, we die. So. I'm thinking about writing Intent to Forgive, but I don't think I've got it in me to write anymore in this kind of way, so I'm kind of journaling, and I want to talk to, what was your name, Aviano, <laughs> about, about what, I'm, what I'm doing, and um, because that's, well, anyway, that's another whole conversation. Um, so five minutes, is that it? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Very pleasant. Five minutes. Thank you. And I'd like to call on Sun Kwan, please. Yes. So, um, 
In the magazine, we have a lot of departments, features, and, and, and besides articles. Uh, we have the face-to-face, -face, which is uh, our title for the interview that we conduct, with, the one we did with Joy Kogawa, for example. We have the community news. We have uh, um, on the firing line, which is very political, and we have reviews, book reviews, movie reviews, and so forth. And one of the uh, most kind of infamous or famous ones uh, is the dubious award, uh, which we give to a um, anybody who wants who who in the media or in real life uh, stereotype Asian Canadians, and um, each issue our dubious award will be will be given to somebody who had stereotype, uh, be it a restaurant, a, a political cartoon, um, and and so forth, and. Uh, to the point that uh, we have a major influence in the mainstream media. Uh, we had, uh, um, Calgary Harrow had a cartoon about Joe Clark and visiting Japan at that time in the 1980s. And it has Bucktooth Japanese uh, bellboys and in guitar shoes and, you know, just stereotyping the whole Japanese n nation. And so we gave them a dubious award, and the, the editor calls and says, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we didn't mean to offend, you know. I said, well, okay, publish your uh, apologies and be done with it. So, and it, it, it becomes su such a uh, um, landmark of what we do that in, in the, in the uh, PhD thesis, this was specifically highlighted as part of our activism that we do, and what I call a counter-narrative. This is our way to counter the mainstream narrative of who we are, uh, um, and uh, in a very satirical and humorous way. So this is something, actually something I wrote. Uh, everybody takes turn writing a, a citation. Uh, some of them are long, some of them are short. Uh, but basically, this is something that I wrote um, with uh, this radio personality, CFRB 1010 in Toronto, called, his name is Gordon Sinclair. So one day, uh, during the height of the Vietnamese boat people uh, refugee crisis, he basically said that, look, you know, these people don't belong to Canada because uh, they, they, they're not used to Canada. Like, you know, they can't live here, you know, that kind of thing. So to that, we reply. Um, no problem here, Gordon Sinclair. Mr. Sinclair is a two-bit radio personality and pseudo-journalist with the Toronto's CFRB 1010 on your dial, decided one day to spew forth his views on the suitability of con and con 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 compatibility of Vietnamese refugees with the great Canadian ethnic mosaic. Not his title, but close enough. Then, over luncheon one fine summer day, thousands of listeners were treated to a dose of Sinclair's thesis, in quotes, with, her, with their spinach salad, a very sour dressing indeed. Yes, Mrs. Sinclair, we agree that Canada's climate is too harsh and cold for the new arrivals. No, we do not agree that the Vietnamese refugees would be better off staying in their part of the world. Have a little faith, Gord. If the Vietnamese survive through monsoons, napalms, and South China Sea pirates, I'm sure they'll be okay this winter in Saskatoon. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so we'll be restarting at five o'clock. So take a few more minutes to um, take a break. And um, I'd like to thank everyone once again for being here. And although it's been a big year for Asian nominees for awards in television and film and literature, it's only been possible with your support. So please spread the word that Liter Asian is in Toronto. And it's only made uh, possible because of U of T support and um, the community support. And also, we have a number of books by Asian authors at the back there. They're um, 
traditional literature as well as genre fiction, science fiction, fantasy as well. So they're a little bit uh, more mainstream and our wonderful volunteers are handling the event. So we'll be commencing at five o'clock, okay? Looks like we'll share a mic. Pardon? Looks like we'll share yeah, a mic. Yeah, so. So what are we talking about today? <laughs> Good question. Oh, yes. Welcome back to Litter Asian Toronto second panel for the day. Um, there might be some people joining us after work and uh, may not have been at the first panel, so I'd like to reiterate how happy we are that you're here with us today for the first Toronto Litter Asian event. Uh, Litter Asian was started in Vancouver by the late Jim Wong Chu and now it's grown to include Toronto. And we are here today to celebrate the best in Canadian arts. The theme today is Asian literary activism the de dictionary definition of activism is the action of using vigorous campaigning to bring about political or social change. And in the first panel, we discussed the history of Asian Canadian literary activism. And for the second panel, we will talk about Asian Canadian literary activism in modern times and the influence on the LGBTQ commu community. And the panel will be moderated by Dr. Tanya Aguilawe. And Dr. Tanya Gilloway is an assistant professor of English at the University of Toronto. Her current book project, Asian Canadian Literary Ecologies, explores the intersection between scientific knowledge seeking and environmental anxiety and contemporary Asian Canadian literature. And our two panelists includes Kai Chen Tom and Shani Mutu. So please welcome me and joining them. And uh, we join me in welcoming them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much for joining us um, on, for this exciting second panel of the day. Um, uh, uh, if you were here for our earlier panel, um, Chuck Kwan's sampling of um, different uh, issues of Asian Asianadian, um, particularly the issue on sexuality, reminded us that um, queer organizing has been a part of Asian Canadian literature for quite a long time. Um, and um, the effort to make space for the expression of queer identities is also uh, um, a long-standing interest within the Asian Canadian Literary Archive, the works of people like Wayson Choi and Sky Lee um, and Hiromi Goto um, come to mind, uh, just to m name a few. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce two writers who, whom I count as two of my favorite writers, um, and um, whose work, I think, beautifully extends the legacy of, of um, the writers that I just mentioned and um, brings them into the contemporary moment. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, each of our speakers in turn. Um, I think we've decided that Ka Cheng is, is going to go first. Is that what is that you like? Do Are you want okay? to go first? Actually, <laughs> I'm like I don't know what I'm gonna say. Do, would, you, would you like to go first? Is I don't okay? know what I'm gonna say either. All right, I can start. I will do it. We will. Okay, yeah. but I would go first if you were more comfortable. Oh, that's it. No, it's that, up to you. Okay. okay. I can go ahead. <laughs> How about I go ahead and then and then you can fill in <laughs> gaps if you see me struggling. I'd be happy that? to. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So I uh, we will have Kai Cheng Tom yeah. first and then <laughs> Shani Mutu and I will introduce them each in turn. So. Um, Kai Cheng Tum is a self-described writer, performer, lasagna lover, oh. and wicked witch. She lives and dreams from the unceded indigenous territories that make up colonial era Canada. A prolific poet, fiction writer, and essayist, her published book-length work 
works include the award-winning Fierce Femmes and Notorious Liars, a Dangerous Trans Girls Confabulous Memoir from Metonymy Press, A Place Called No Homeland, um, a poetry collection from Arsenal Pulp, and From the Stars in the Sky to the Fish in the Sea, who's, uh, which is a, a favorite of my oh, toddlers. Um, so it's a children's book, uh, also from Arsenal Pulp Press. Uh, she has featured as a performer at such venues, including Versus International Poetry Festival, the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word, Word on the Street Toronto, the Blue Metropolis Festival, and numerous other literary festivals. She has also completed the spoken word residency at the Banff Center and the Arise residency at Eventual Ashes Theater and Buddies in Bad Times Theater. A social worker by trade, Kai Cheng is deeply experienced, is a deeply experienced arts facilitator and workshop provider. She combines her knowledge of mental health, art space, community organizing, and writing in order to provide arts education that nourishes the creative soul as well as technical skill. So welcome. Thank you. Wow, that's a really long bio, and I feel like I must have written it myself, but that's so <laughs> embarrassing now to hear it read out uh, loud. Hey, has it ever happened to you where someone asked you to write about yourself? And you're like, I'm just gonna do two sentences, but then you're like, wow, I'm really narcissistic when you hear it out loud. <laughs> 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 or maybe just very insecure. Um, they're kind of the same thing. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor. Um, especially to be sitting here with you, Shani. Um, I, I was you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now I'm blushing. Um, <laughs> it's so it really is an honor. I would be I would feel even better about it had I you know prepared um, like a more extensive or fulsome um, set of remarks. But I, I think we're kind of just uh, we're kind of. Uh, making it up as we go along, as it were, um, or uh, speaking off the cuff. I will say um, I'm really uh, I'm really sad that I couldn't be here for the first set of panels uh, this afternoon. I was uh, at my day job as a social worker in a youth mental health agency, and I'm really sad about that because I see that my VIP chair was reserved beside beside Joy Kagawa's VIP chair, and that would have been a good time to network, you know, um, because uh, because because Joy Kagawa is of course such a, a seminal figure in Asian Canadian literature. Um, in some ways, I think it is like uh, metaphorical or like or a good metaphor that uh, I missed that panel, though I wasn't able to awkwardly introduce myself to Joy uh, because um, I feel that way like a lot as a 27-year-old uh, trans woman uh, writer of, of Chinese descent in this country. I, I feel like I've missed the boat, um, for lack of better expression. Um, you are very much on the boat, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but as you say, you know, I don't feel that way because, because um, I think largely because uh, there is such like um, often like an intergenerational gap in among uh, yes. Asian literary creators yes. and queer in particular. Um, like I remember coming up as a writer, and, and uh, the first time I actually encountered Joy Kagawa was uh, that she came and did a like a workshop for children at a library that I was volunteering at when I was 14. The Fraser View branch in uh, South Vancouver, if that means anything to any of you. <laughs> um, and I remember just being blown away, right? I was just like blown away by the presence of this incredible shining figure in the literary arts. And then, you know, of course, discovering all of the things um, that uh, Joy Kagawa has done and written um, uh, you know, reading Obasan for the first time at, at 15 or 16 years old. Um, so feeling that moment of like, wow, this this can happen. Um, a queer person, I mean, sorry, an Asian person can be a writer um, in Canada, and also feeling like a profound like, oh, like I'm never going to actually get to hang out with Joy Kagawa though, or and I'm never going to receive mentorship um, as a queer young person. And I think um, like looking at queer Asian uh, activism and literary production is such um, is such an interesting thing in terms of like the metaphor of like oh I just missed it or there wasn't quite enough like mm -hmm. there wasn't quite enough connection hey like I remember the the second Asian author I discovered who the first one who was queer um, is Andy Kwan I don't know if folks yes yeah yes. someone I've never met mm -hmm. actually right um, because I think he moved to Australia before I became an adult. Um, and to discover his writing in a collection, I believe, called Calendar Boy um, back in the early thousands and to think, oh my gosh, this is the first gay 
um, Asian writer that I've encountered, and then you know, like a sprinkling of others, yourself included, um, Shani, and to think like, okay, and, and here it is again, this moment of connection that wasn't quite close enough. Like I didn't actually meet another um, Asian queer writer, especially one who was uh, like, um, perhaps more activist minded or um, politically inclined until I was in my mid 20s and I'm still in my mid 20s now <laughs> um, and um, and it, it's that gap that that I think leaves me a bit out of a lot at a loss for words when I think about okay like what can I speak to off the cuff um, at a panel about the contributions or the legacy of uh, queer Asian literary activism, not that the lineage isn't there, because it, it most certainly has been, and we've just heard some of those names, right? Um, Waste and Choi also comes to mind, as is Sky Lee, of course. Um, but, but it feels like there is a generational gap there. Um, and um, perhaps this is like I indicative of queer Asian or Asian literary communities in, in general, like our numbers are not large. Um, the nature of diaspora and uh, like the traumatic disconnection that happens between generations, the loss of language, um, the AIDS crisis, all of these like giant severing forces that uh, split generations apart means that each generation in some way feels like it is reinventing the wheel or, you know, looking at, like, Looking, looking to the past and thinking, gosh, if only I had known these people uh, in a closer and better way. Um, so I think about queer Asian um, authors who, who came up around the same time as me, uh, or you know, who, I'm, who I find myself you know, often sharing like a, like a green room with at the festival, right? Um, which doesn't actually happen that often either, because we're still at a point, I think, in Canadian literary uh, organizing where like, they invite like, the one queer Asian author, and like, this is it. <laughs> um, representation uh, is not, an old, not, an old, not, uh, not a new story. Um, but I think about, so um, Vivek Shreya, of course, comes to mind, Jaching Wilson Yang, um, and uh, a few others. I, I speak uh, like mostly to like, trans women's writing as well, because that's something that has been missing for a long time. Um, and all of us, um, when I'm talking about these things, oh, I also, I'm also thinking about David Lee right now, who, who's a book coming out from Arsenal Pulp in, uh, I think, next spring. Um, we all talk about this, like the lack of connection or like mentorship, right? We have literary heroes. We don't have literary mentors necessarily. Um, and that is something profound, I think. Um, in like the experience of coming up as a writer is of like, okay, how did you do this though? I see that you have done it. How did it happen? And, and that is, I think, even more particular to queer community because um, there are so many questions. Like not just how do you become a writer and how do you do this living as an artist thing, but also how do you survive? Mm, how do you explain this to your parents, both being a writer and being queer? You know, both of which gi giant no-nos, uh, for me at least, not to, not to overgeneralize. Um, <laughs> um, what about writing about family? What about writing about uh, mental illness, trauma, these things that, uh, you know, growing up in a Christian Chinese uh, community in Vancouver in the 1990s were, you know, considered, were, were taboo, were, you know, were things to be held in secret. Um, and I think still are in a lot of ways. So you know, things have changed. And so when, when I think about, um, maybe I'll just end on this note quickly, uh, is, is uh, I think about that misconnection. Um, and I think about like what, what I hope to contribute as a community member, as well as a writer, um, in queer Asian uh, arts communities. And I think about that, like building connections that endure and that reach out and like using, taking the opportunity of that social media presents us, um, like that this movement, like a movement around uh, leftism and identity politics based uh, organizing and writing to, to shape an experience for, um, for both the generation that came before mine and the generation that comes next uh, of, of, of having the conversation, right? Um, how do you do this thing and what is it like? Um, yeah. Okay, that's me. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for those remarks. Oh Hi, Chung. And um, I think we will move on to Shani and then may perhaps have a conversation afterwards, more of a freestyle conversation afterwards. Um, so I will introduce our second guest, um, Shani Mutu, who was born in Ireland, grew up in Trinidad, and has lived in Canada most of her life. 
She holds an MA in English from the University of Guelph, writes fiction and poetry, and is a visual artist who exhibits locally and internationally. Mutu's novels include Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab, long-listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, short-listed for the Lambda Award, Valkyrie's Daughter, long-listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, He Drowned She in the Sea, long-listed for the Dublin Impact Award, and Serious Blooms at Night, short-listed for the Giller Prize, and long-listed for the Man Booker Prize. She is a recipient of the K.M. Hunter Award, Arts Award, a 2000 Chalmers Fellowship Award, and most recently, the James Duggan's Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Award. Her visual art has been exhibited locally and internationally, most notably at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City and at the Venice Biennale at the Transculture Pavilion. And she lives in Southern Ontario still, or no, you're now? In Southern Ontario, yes. yes. Still. Okay, and um, Shani was just telling me that she has some really exciting things in the works. Uh, a yeah. new novel coming out in 2020 by the title of Polar Vortex and also um, that her um, seminal novel, Serious Blooms at Night, has been optioned for a movie. So. <laughs> well, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. Um, and particularly for listening to the three uh, speakers earlier. It's a history that I didn't, you know, kind of knew, but not uh, in that sort of detail. And I was um, very moved to hear about it. And it also provoked to me because um, I noticed that um, South Asians, uh, which I got lumped into, and I'll, I'll, and I'll tell you in a minute why I say that, um, were a ver basically quite absent from that history as it was told earlier. Um, I, they, I have a very strong memory of, you see, I came out of a visual arts background. Writing actually came to me through the activism uh, that happened in the early 90s. Um, there was an exhibition at, um, at uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery uh, of um, British um, South Asian uh, painters, artists, Shutapa Biswas, um, uh, Sunil Gupta, people like that. They were being uh, shown at the time. And um, Shutapa was invited to come to my house by a group of us who would get together, people like um, Chris Creighton Kelly, um, Ian Rashid, uh, and I'm very happy to say these names out here right now, Zul Suleiman, um, Sh Sharazad Jamal, all artists and people involved in the arts. And Zul would eventually put together a magazine called Rung. But um, we got together to invite Shutapa. And this happened in the kitchen of my house on Granville Street in Vancouver. And Shitapa, the night she came over, she said, well, are you all coming to the opening at the Vancouver Art Gallery of this show of South Asian artists? And we said, no, we didn't know about the opening. And she said, um, uh, but you have to come. Uh, you're the only people that, that I know now. And she went back to the VAG, and they said, no, we weren't members. And she said, but they are, they are my South Asian friends. And they said, sorry. And she said, well, are any South Asian people coming? And they, and they said, we don't know. And she said, did you do out any outreach? No. So that we asked the VAG to go. And they said, no, nope, sorry, we can't go to it. So we got together. We said, OK, the night we are going to immediately start protesting at night outside of the VAG. We went, I don't know how word got around, but there were all kinds of people of color. There were native people. There were, um, uh, uh, what's the word, queer people, gay and lesbian people, walking in front of the VAG. It became, it, it became a situation that was, um, uh, you know, got on the news right across the country, and there was a lot of, lot of questions being asked. and. The VAG asked eventually if we would have a meeting with them. We, and uh, uh, the, the, the 
the people who were protesting just grew and grew night after night. So a theater company offered the, their space for us to have the meeting. And at that meeting, all kinds of um, uh, publishers, uh, gallery curators, uh, theater people showed up for it. So it was the start of something that um, uh, basically had people saying, well, we've got to get you all on the boards of all these organizations and so on. And I saw my friends who were artists and writers, I saw them start going on to boards. And I panicked. And I said, I can't do this. I need to do my work, which is my artwork. And eventually, I was asked by a, a you know, press gang there to, um, to, to write for them because of this color, this color. And um, that was amazing. You know, it started something fabulous for me, this writing career. But I did not want to be an activist. And I still don't want to be an activist. I have no desire to be an activist. But there are two things. One is, in a country like this, when you, when, you, when you start to make your art and your writing and so on, your writing of your experience, and the work turns out mm -hmm. to be seen as activist work. Mm -hmm. It is in a kind of way. And the second thing is after spending a, a lifetime of doing that kind of work and having a certain amount of visibility where I can pull back now and say, I'm just going to do what I want to do. I can't because your conscience, you realize, actually, You've been taught you, and you know you you understand something greater that we're in we're in trouble. Very much the world that Joy was talking about earlier. This feels wrong to call her Joy. Mm -hmm. That Joy Kogawa that. was uh, <laughs> talking about earlier. <coughs> but um, but also uh, even as people of color, I I I really thought. I, when we were working so hard and we had those placards out there and we were going down the street and we were doing our work, I believed things would change. And I cannot believe that we have gone back to being on the margin. So I believe the work still has to go on. I think I'm long overdue, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> Over time. Um, yes. Well, thank you both for those powerful comments. Um, um, and I think we have time still for questions or maybe a chat between the three of us first, because I was really interested in um, the fact, actually, that not just in, in your comments um, for both of you, but also throughout the day, we've been talking a lot about um, intergenerational um, interactions, intergenerational gaps, um, uh, uh, also intergenerational struggle um, uh, that Lynn talked about earlier with uh, early days of um, um, uh, re uh, the organizing for the redress movement. And um, uh, it, in I was interested in this question of um, uh, talking across generations, especially in the context of um, your both of your works in the sense that you you you've both written works that um, uh, take up the figure of the child, the abandoned child, um, or the the queer child. Mm -hmm. um, you, um, you know, you have the figure of Mala in in your first novel, Shani, um, and then you also have the figure of Jonathan, who is trying to reconnect with the lost parent. Um, in, in your latest novel and um, in, in your poetry, Kai Chen, you talk about um, the diaspora babies and right. the sort of like the baggage, the intergenerational baggage that they carry. And I wondered, um, yeah, if you could just talk a little bit more about that, that interest in, um, um, yeah, the intergenerational memory and trauma and also the figure of the child more generally. Um, what what it, what role it plays in your writing? Hmm. That's such a good question because uh, for me, if you don't mind me just jumping in, um, the the idea of the child, um, or even cross generational or generational, 
I think probably for a lot of queer people, I was at a, um, uh, an event not long ago in Toronto where um, someone came up to me and said that I was an elder. <laughs> No, and I had to support them. <laughs> I had to support the young writers and so on. And it's very interesting because she was um, she's a queer person who said this to me, uh, and I was thinking to myself, elder. I don't even know what it is to be an adult. Mm -hmm. And it, the timelines that I think um, you know um, in heterosexuality mm -hmm. that allow you to um, have mark as you 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 know with uh, with family how you see family moving and so on for for most most people most and most people most heterosexual people queer people don't really have those necessarily certainly not in my generation generation but um i uh i think the child Part, I mean, we could start, you know, getting into psychology here. But the child in my stories is very much still me struggling to be seen and for for a voice. And I'm just putting it into those those characters. Um, yes, Sydney is an older person, but Sydney's stories are all they're all related to that desire to be seen. So so. Um, he never becomes um, a, a person. He's always in the state of childhood, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, one of the things that I found interesting as well this morning, thinking about it, Desh Pradesh. Do you remember J Desh Pradesh? Um, it was an attempt to bring South Asians together. And when we got together, we, one, I think one of the reasons that um, that kind of thing for South Asians was so difficult. Is that, you know, as South Asians in the diaspora, we were taken and scattered, and we lost our language, or, or languages, or the original languages. When we got together at Desh, there was always these, these, the, these factions. And, and I was not a proper Asian because I didn't have a mother language. You know, I didn't have a language. Um, I, and the other Asians, they would perform their various languages mm -hmm. and their songs and so on from childhood, from back home, and I had none of that sort of thing. So, and as a queer person, uh, um, there was a f further fractioning. So, you know, I, I, it's kind of hard. I just want to name Ian Rashid, uh, Vivek Shreya, um, uh, Shutupa, Norbezi Philip, Dion Brand. Uh, you see, I have to put blacks in there because it, when I was growing up in Trinidad, um, what was important to us was the black power movement. We were we were tr struggling against Britain. We were not, and then there there came this thing: the blacks and the Indians. And what is Trinidadian? So I think of myself more Trinidadian. I am the color of of uh, an, uh, an, uh, uh, an Asian, but I'm a Trinidadian at heart, you know. Sorry, carry on. Oh no, <laughs> I would have you carry on for the rest of the panel. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> the figure of the child. Okay. The diaspora took babies. So far. Um, I know. Child. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was amazing. It was like, I love it. The figure of the child. Um, I mean, the the, the child, uh, like the lost child or the dispossessed child, is is like a trope, right? In diasporic Asian mm -hmm. literature. Um, it's also a trope in, um, in like queer or gay yeah. literature, and it has been for a long time. I, I, it's funny, I, was trying, I kind of made this joke when I, in, in this review I wrote of judging Wilson Yang's uh, first novel, um, Small Beauty, which I, I think every uh, queer Asian, I think every Asian person should read. Um, it's fantastic, but in, in, in that, uh, in that review I made this joke like, um, yes, judging Wilson Yang, uh, you know, Riffs upon these familiar themes for for uh, for queer the familiar themes for queer people, um, childhood loss, haunting trauma, as well as for Asians, childhood loss, haunting <laughs> trauma, <laughs> right? And, and we see this in in a, um, American Asian literature. We see it in American queer literature as well. We are like obsessed with the child. I mean, to to get into psychology, right? Um, I think everyone is a, a little bit obsessed with the child within because we, we never get to be a child long enough. And, and we never get to grow up. We never enough. get to grow up. Yeah, it's, it's this interesting thing. Yeah. Um, I think especially for, yeah, for queer people, like, um, 
you know, we have, there's that Peter Pan syndrome of like always um, like living uh, as a youth and like not knowing what it means to be an adult because there isn't a model for queer adulthood really. Um, but then there's also like the Wendy syndrome where um, you don't have parents really who are effectively parenting you and your friends don't have effective parents. So you are parenting each other. Um, and getting it quite wrong, <laughs> actually. Um, and it's, it's tragic, uh, to, to be honest. At my, at my job, I, um, like I only work with, que with queer youth. I'm a therapist to trans youth who are mostly marginally housed or homeless. And, um, and all of them are way too mature for their age. Right? Like they know way too many things. Um, and they also don't know like so many, and it's fascinating uh, that you say, you know, um, this person said to you, you know, you're an elder. I, I think I said the same thing to Trish Sella once, by the way, and she was like, <laughs> I do not identify. And I was like, okay, fair. Um, and, and then I had the moment, because, you know, I'm, I'm 27, and I had a, a client recently say, so as an elder trans woman, I was like, what are you talking about? I'm in my mid 20s, I keep saying this. Um, so, so we're obsessed with childhood, right? Because we, I think we're trying to figure out what does it mean to develop? Um, as an individual and generationally. Like, if, if you don't know what it means to be a queer adult, and I don't know what it means to be a queer adult, and we also both don't know what it means to really be a child in the sense of being held and yet and these people want so badly to have us as adults. They want right? it. Yeah. What are we to do? We have to, I mean, you know, we can only write and rant about it, I think, um, and, and try to figure it out, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful discussion intergenerational um, um, negotiations and, and that figure of a child and at this point I guess I'd like to open up for um, to questions from the audience Thank you. It's not so much a question. Uh, thank you so much. It's really thrilling to see you both. And I'm really intrigued by the accidental uh, emergence of the topic of this, you know, um, Toronto chapter of the Literation Festival and the intergenerational <coughs> issue. Mm -hmm. I think it's extremely important. For instance, you mentioned Ian Iqbal Rashid. He was a good friend. I remember Ran. I published the review of a Funny Boy by... Uh, Shyam. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah. It, that's part of, I mean, I'm not Asian, obviously, but that, his, that was my community uh, for many years when I lived out west. And I remember the editor of Rang Magazine. So I'm not going into a nostalgia trip, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but I, I, what I'm trying to say is that I noticed in the last while with all these interesting scandals or whatever we want to call them that have been coming through Canlit, different mm -hmm. circles of Canlit, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that one of the things that I've noticed is that the younger generation of writers, uh, different generations of younger writers, don't seem to know what Canlit was and what it has become. Mm -hmm. uh, don't s they, they seem to suffer from a certain kind of presentism. And I'm not saying that as a criticism against the younger generations. I think it's also the responsibility of the subsequent generations, not necessarily <coughs> the elders, but you know, subsequent generations to make sure that what uh, efforts they had to make uh, what you know? What it was like, and why? How it has reached this point? And mm -hmm. we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, but it's important to know the tra different trajectories, the different communities, queer communities, Asian Canadian communities have gone through, indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. So I would like to hear you meditate or think loudly about what do you think as a younger writer, uh, as a younger elder writer, and as a, a quote <laughs> older writer, um, you th how you think you could bring different generations together in terms of maybe not active, you know, different forms of writing, mentorship programs, or what? Thank you. But it's, I mean, it's so perfect what you just said. When, when I was listening to the, the other speakers earlier, one of the things I was thinking is that this is so, this organization or this conferencing is so needed. I felt so appreciative for it because it, it, is, um, it is preserving, creating, preserving, and getting the history out. 
and the history is missing. Mm-hmm. At that conference, I don't remember what it was called now, it was something at the harbor front a few months ago. Do you remember? Um, <coughs> Um, I was uh, Canadian writers or something like that, and um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and I went to uh, I went to one of the panels. What they asked me to come to it, and I was um, the, it was all these young uh, uh, people of color. You see, in my world, it can't just be Asian, right? It's got to be everybody. So there were all these people of color there. Yeah, very, very young people. They were like in their 20s and so on. They're, so, so they're writers. They're in the writing world. And they were talking as if no one has ever done any activism whatsoever for people of color mm-hmm. in terms of literature, in terms of writing and so on. This was brand new to them. And um, I felt that they needed to know the history. But the other thing that I was so devastated by was the fact that they were experiencing the very same things that I remember experiencing mm-hmm. 20 or 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing is, um, the, you know, the, the Governor General Award this year, I was uh, one of the jurors for fiction. And I have to say that on the jury, uh, on the, um, no, I, I can't talk about the jury, obviously, right? But I can say from my part, um, there was a lot of writing by people of color and by Asians, lots of stuff published, and a lot of it quite weak. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if publishers are jumping onto this as, you know, in in the way that it was uh, several, a couple decades ago, just, you know, publishing us because we need to be out there, or they need to have us out there, maybe for their granting or whatever. But um, Mm. there was some, some strong work, but not a lot of strong work, and I could say that for the um, for the white writers too. There was a lot of very weak work, and quite a bit of very very good work too. So I don't know. Maybe it falls out in that kind of way. But uh, the other thing is the whole idea of mentoring. I don't understand mentoring. In the days when I was growing up, I chose a mentor, and they probably didn't even know about it. <laughs> and I was, I knew everything that was going on with that mentor. When people call me up now and say they want to pay me to be somebody's mentor for three months, it's like, I don't understand. So, you know, I'm happy to do it for the money, but, uh, you know, <laughs> let me just say quickly. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I just want to, the Harbor Front, is this the Canadian Authors Association? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so they've actually, they are looking for diversity. I have to say they are not, oh, sorry, they're not a very diverse group. Uh, so I won a draw and I became a member and now they're making me co-president of the Toronto branch. Wow. So hopefully we can get some oh, events good. going. Fantastic. And, uh, but it's, <laughs> the group is, yeah, consists of many older writers, uh, not very young people. Not very many people even know about the group. I didn't even know until I won the raffle, honestly. <laughs> and I was like, all right. And, uh, and I had a short story published. So that's why I was invited to the party oh. at that oh. conference oh, and won the raffle. So hopefully in the future, by, I guess, because one of my friends was asking me, like, I want to write, but I don't have time. So I've been volunteering my time to do conferences, etc., and speak. But I know if I don't do that, I mean, how many people are willing to volunteer and do stuff and promote? I mean, it's just one of those things. There's not enough of us. I think if all of us did a little bit, maybe, I could step down and do writing. But I think at the time, right now, I think it's important for us to sort of work together as a community and sort of get our voices out there. So it's a critical time, I think. Oh, I have so much to say in response also. <laughs> but maybe I can just use this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is easier. Thank you. OK. Oh my goodness, uh, Shani, everything you say makes me sit up and listen, and I'm like, oh, I want to say stuff too, and I'm like, okay. Um, Do I talk too much? Sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, you should talk more. Um, I, th- I think, um, yeah, well, I, I want to speak to the, the mentorship piece, because I think what you mentioned, like, uh, so we don't know how to be mentors, we didn't have mentors in the sense of, like, someone talking to you and kind of helping uh, like edit your work and like plan a career as a writer. Like I, I never had that. I still don't have that. Um, but maybe we would choose figures, right? The heroes, um, 
who stood out and like um, learn about them. And I mean, that was difficult. Um, at least I remember it being difficult. Uh, every time I go to a festival now, um, and I, I went to a bunch because all of my books came out in, in like the space of like 12 <laughs> months. And so people, so I was just going to festivals like every week it felt like, and people were like, who is this girl? Why is she around? What's, what's happening? Um, and um, and every, every time I went to a festival, like I remember the last one was in, in Saskatoon, um, was in Moose Jaw. And um, young people of color would come up and find me. Um, sometimes they would be a little older than me, actually. Um, but you know, we were young together. And they would look at me and, and with, with these eyes, right? And they would be like, tell me everything about you. <laughs> everything. <laughs> but then it turned out they already knew everything because they were on my social media and they, you know, had, had dived deep. Um, and, 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 and you just feel that yearning, right? And, and these, the question always comes like, can I have your email? Can we stay in touch? I would like to be a writer, a singer, a model. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, and, and I always say yes, actually, um, which, which is a mistake. Don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> because they will email you, and then you're going to disappoint someone by forgetting to reply, or your reply is inadequate, or whatever. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't think the answer can be, like, tough kid, figure it out. Like, I think that was the answer to me for such a long time. And let, let me be honest, too. I, you know, I look at, we, we talk about generational friction, but there was so much in Canlit right now. Um, and I, I, you know, I came in making jokes about it and I, to try to speak about it more sweetly, but I feel some bitterness too. Like, I feel pretty angry, to be honest, if someone's going to really drill down and ask me, how do I feel about, um, like, Asian Canadian literary community's legacy to me, like, as a transsexual woman um, who's 27 years old, and apparently all this stuff has been done, and I, 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 have, I have looked for it, right? Like, um, I've researched the lineages. I have spent, I spent, like, all this time in the Fraser View South Vancouver Library Branch typing into the catalog, right? Um, did those people look for me? Did the famous Asian Canadian writers who were queer and writing and doing activism, did they look for me? Did they look and say, Who, who's coming up now? Can I make myself available? Do you need help? Are you experiencing the same thing I experienced 10 or 15 years ago? How sad that is. I wish I could help you. No, no, no one did that. No, and, and I didn't get invited to uh, speak at any kind of Asian literary event, anything, until this one. The first time I was contacted by Rice Paper, um, even though I had been writing and publishing in BuzzFeed and um, uh, like literary, uh, like uh, Asian American Literary Review years ago, uh, the first time was when, my, when, was when this book came out last year. And only because David Lee, who is 23, I think, decided to review the book. I was told by a prominent Asian Canadian writer, like, don't, don't think about um, trying to get reviewed in Rice Paper. You're a transsexual, it won't happen. Don't think about getting into literation either. You're a transsexual, it won't happen. So this question fills me with a bit of anger, actually. Like, the, like, I, I, like if, if mentorship is what is needed, well, it wasn't there for me, which is why I feel so strongly about, like, I may not know how to be an adult, but I have to fucking learn, right? And I mean, that's why I'm a therapist now. I'm not always good at it. Um, youth always tell me, you know, you're, you're terrible therapist catching. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're so bad at this. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I'm learning, I'm learning. Um, and, you know, they're bitter when I disappoint them, whatever. I'm like, oh, how dare you, stupid kids, whatever. But I think this whole thing about, like, you know, the older generation of queers is always like, you need to know the history. Um, you need to listen up, kiddo. And my response to that, as someone who has been both younger and elder in my community um, is mentorship is not really about talking to a young person, like talking at a young person. It is about listening to the young person. Because if we just try and if we try to do this thing where we're like, oh, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to learn, this is what I think, this is what I think, we don't really hear like what is the young person's vision for themselves. We don't hear what this new generation of queer Asian writers' vision is for what they want to do. And I think I think to skip over to assume that they don't have one because they are young is a mistake. You're not mad at rice paper alliteration anymore. <laughs> no, I feel so embarrassed about that now, to be honest. But uh, you know, uh, 
Love it. <laughs> there was a question in the back. There's been a lot of talk about intergenerational um, difference, I guess, in terms of literature. And, and I'm thinking about some conversations I've seen online from the Ameri Asian American community where it's more the difference between first generation immigrants, so mm -hmm. Asians and people who grew up, who were born and grew up in North America, and how that, um, that changes the way that uh, well, obviously, that changes the perspective in which they write and how that's reflected, and how there's a tendency to lump Asians and Asian Americans, Asian Canadians all together when really there's a huge divide, or not divide, but difference. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak a bit about that. About the tendency to like lump? Lump. Um, to, I guess, conflate first generation immigrant, Asian immigrant experiences. Uh, and literature mm -hmm. with Asian Canadian literature, meaning people who actually who are of, of Asian descent, but are actually born and grew up here, and so have a completely different perspective. Oh God! <laughs> um, I would say, like I, you know, ca Canadian literary community in general is small, right? Like it's a closed loop in a lot of ways. Asian Canadian literary culture is, is smaller. Um, you hear the same names a lot. Um, every time there's a new name, it's very exciting. Um, I mean, in some ways, I think it is inevitable um, that like the Though, that those two experiences, Asian American and Asian Canadian, are going to be conflated because so many of like the standouts like li of literary production in English um, among Asians are, are American, right? Like Amy Tan, of course. Like you know, is, everyone's sick of her, but also we have to be grateful. <laughs> um, and um, and like I, I think um, like. It's the work like Joy Kagawa's, you have to say Joy Kagawa, right? Those are two names, or Waste and Choice, where, you know, like the historicity um, of like waves of migration and lineage are really brought out in like that kind of work uh, is, how, is how we can like pull that out and, and resist it in a lot of ways. Um, in some ways, I'm not so interested, I would have to say, in like the project of really building like an Asian Canadian shape of literature, because uh, to me, that sounds a little bit like. Uh, like like buying into the into internationalism, right? Um, and I, I'm much more interested in creating like a, a diasporic Asian body of, of of literature, which is how I tend to think about um, the lineages of writing that I, I I come from and that I I try to honor in my work, um, because because the distinction is like is is, a, is essentially based on a colonial border. Well, what I would like to see is um, we'll have to go through the diasporic thing that you're talking about. Um, what I would like to see is that we are not always expected to be Asian writers or Caribbean writers or black writers or you know Indian writers or whatever, um, but that we could be individuals with our individual stories. And until that happens, um, we will have to go through this constant, like we are part of a group. It is the, the activism, it is the political movement to, to getting published and to getting seen and having our artwork, um, you know, given the same sort of status as the, the mainstream. But, um, <coughs> but because that is still not happening, we fall into these um, stereotyping kinds of stories and so on. At the same time, I have to tell you, one of the books that I saw on the uh, on the GG jury this year is a book by uh, I can't believe I'm not remembering her name. I think it might be Carol Leung. Carrie Ann Leung. Yes, yeah. thank you. Oh, that she time is I love so you. Mm -hmm. yes. She's so good. She's so the work is so amazing, and it is not. It is not. Um, it is not falling into those stereotypes. She steps right out of it. Um, you might ask, well, why is she not on the jury? Because there were five other books that were just 
Mm. You know, oh, you know who else brings someone? It's Catherine Hernandez as well, an uh, Asian Canadian writer whose work is like really breaking out of like the box of like the diasporic storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it will happen one person at a time, two people a year, three people a year, and so on. But it's happening. It's taking so long, though. It's taking a while. You know. Shani, I wondered if I could pick up on this question of tokenization that you've been raising with a lot of your comments. What you just said now about, you know, the difficulty of um, uh, of having. Um, not just Asian Canadian writers, but writers of color more generally recognized as ri as writers with individual stories. And then your earlier comments that um, about um, press gang wanting wanting you to write for them um, because of the color of your skin. And um, it seems like you know we're at this moment where the what people have been referring to as the dumpster fire of Canadian literature has created this hunger for different kinds of stories and um, and it seems like in that sense it's a it's it's a promising time for um, writers of color and queer writers of color we have like um, Vivek Shreya's uh, imprint at Arsenal Pulp um, uh, and it seems like you know things like social media have opened up a platform for people to express that hunger for other kinds of stories. And so it seems like an exciting time to be, possibly to be a queer writer of color. And yet um, that is shadowed by that same sort of potential for tokenization that, that, that you were locating in like that earlier movement from 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so I wondered, no, at this particular moment, like what is needed to to break out of that expectation or break out of that kind of um, uh, yeah tokenization of, of, ri of writers of, of color and queer writers. What has to change? I don't have an answer. What uh, th one thing I would say is that I could play along right now and just be the Asian. You know, and that would be allowing the tokenism to go on. But I, um, I am naming it. I am mm -hmm. saying, and at the same time, I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I, I, because I think this is a really important conversation. And in fact, if you had an Asian, uh, a brown skin Asian like myself here, who was from Asia itself or from that background, I would probably have issue with that as well and say, well, you know what, we have an Asian kind of um, experience as well. And we are, once again, as Caribbean people, we're invisible because, you know, so it's complex. It's incredibly complex. And, you know, I think we j it's something that we're just going to keep having to fight. Look, you know, um, What's his name? Uh, Joshua Whitehead's book, uh, Johnny Appleseed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic book. But as soon as it came out, they tried to shut it down. You know, it's, it, we, we, so many places tried to shut that book down. So it, we just, I don't know, it's an ongoing fight. I, I hate to be pessimistic, but this is a cause for celebration, mm -hmm. this event. So little things like this, building constantly. No, I don't mean that this is a little thing. Okay, I, I mean think th events like this, um, constantly pushing, making us stronger. But, um, but once again, I don't want to be part of a group. I just want to be me writing about my is my things. You know. Do you think that, <coughs> the, uh, thank you. Uh, what do you <coughs> think the, um, the tendency to keep this group identification going is coming from? Because I think it's coming from the dominant mainstream society at large. But I also think in some cases it comes from within the groups sometimes. But uh, why shouldn't so we? Sorry, yes. carry on. No, no, I, I just I think it's important to understand that when 
it happens, at least in my mind, sometimes it signals tokenism, it signals stereotyping, it signals the worst aspects of multiculturalism and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But some other times, I think one of the panelists, I think it was Dr. Kwan, who said there's strength in numbers, so there is a yes. sense of solidarity, you make a stronger point. And so I, th I think it's, it's not necessarily a neither or, but it may be necessary at certain political moments in order to galvanize people, and it may be mm -hmm. problematic in other moments. I don't know. I'm thinking you answered it perfectly. I, I mean, that's it. You know, we have we have to come together, and I, we wouldn't be we, we I wouldn't be here if it weren't for this kind of act, activism of you know done in the past and stuff like that. And um, but but it's not all that I wanted. The, they have to exist together. I wanted mm -hmm. to point out um, Vivek Shreya's imprint at Arsenal Pulp, which, which was brought up earlier, as like um, an example of a project I think is really speaking to all of the questions that we are asking today. Um, first of all, around mentorship and intergenerationality. For those of you who don't know, VS <coughs> is Vivek Shreya's imprint at Arsenal Pulp, um, where every season, I believe, or maybe every year, I can't, I can't remember, um, like a, a never, like a, a first-time book-length uh, manuscript author is selected, and I think they have to be under the age of 25, uh, maybe 29. I'm not sure. Young, um, and um, that the selected writer then enters into a dialogue with Vivek, um, where she works with them over the course of the year to edit that manuscript, which is then published. Um, uh, through Arsenal. And um, I love that uh, because it is really so much about uh, Vivek giving back, um, like a gift um, to community, building a network uh, of writers who um, like have intergenerational lineage but are also empowered to speak to the projects they want to work to today and work on today. And then when it comes to um, like the question of tokenism, like I think. Um, like I think part of the problem around tokenism is like you know like white people have the power and the money right and we're always defining ourselves in relation to them or like um, as like in some way shaped by by colonization or whiteness um, and um, I think. Uh, this is probably going to be a controversial reference now, but Juno Diaz speaks about this. Um, uh, um, you know, like the, the conversation that happens inside the margin is so much more interesting than the one that happens between the margin and, and, and the mainstream. Um, and I, th I think this is part of the answer, right? It's building institutions, uh, an institutional memory, intergenerational conversation um, where, where that conversation can happen. So then you don't have to worry about being a token because a token only exists in relation to the mainstream. Uh, I want to address the um, strength in numbers and coming together. Um, uh, I know that you all want to be individual. You don't want to be seen as token or stereotype as an Asian Canadian or, or Chinese Canadian. <laughs> but I don't think we are at the stage right now that we can break away from that collective um, destination. Uh, the, we are still a quote-unquote minority in the mainstream society. Uh, I, whether you like it or not, people look at us differently, and people judge us differently. And that's the, re that's the kind of thing that we had 40 years ago. That's why we had to get together and say, look, uh, we, we might be Korean, we might be South Asian, we might be Vietnamese, but we all have to get together to, to have that identity, to push ourselves into the mainstream society. Uh, and that until, until you have bigger, big enough numbers and influence that you can even overtake the mainstream and force Canada to recognize that we are multicultural rather than just white Anglo-Saxon. So that's a kind of dialogue that uh, you know, we were having at that time. So I, you know, as, as an elder, um, <laughs> Kai, Kai I, I don't think you know what, what it means to be called ancestors. I was called an ancestor. We were called ancestors. What? It, at the, in, the, uh, in the PhD thesis, the last chapter talks about what the ancestors gave us. 
<laughs> so, so you know, that's even a worse term than elder. <laughs> we, you know, you know, you're you're absolutely right. Outside, outside of this, I, I live in a place where there are about five people of color. You know, in in Prince Edward County, and there, I am always insisting that I am a person of color, that that is my tribe. You know, my tribe is not in Prince Edward County. When I come into a room like this, this is where I can do my other activism and say, I want you to know who I am. Because this is the only w place where you might, where someone might say, you know, you're right. Otherwise, uh, you know, in a place like Prince Edward County, they say, but we don't, we don't think of you as a person of color. Mm. You know, um, you're one of us. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, I absolutely agree with you, but there is another kind of activism that goes on right in the room like this here. Mm. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and I, I just wanted to, uh, in, I guess uh, Hannah Kim has, uh, is gonna host another one, one of these shows, uh, November 15th, next, next Thursday, right here in the East Asian Library between four and seven, is the a tribute to Tony Chan, who is the uh, who was the co-founder of uh, Asian Indian, and also our 40th anniversary, uh, our 40th birthday bash. So you're all welcome to come and see these ancestors. <laughs> 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 and here's talk about old times. <laughs> well, wow. on, on that um, note and with that invitation, I think it's time to close the second panel. Thank you, Shani, and thank you, Kai Cheng, for those beautiful thank and powerful you, remarks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's um, uh, dim sum on the way and uh, mm -hmm. wow. uh, a couple of brief readings as well. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much uh, for all our panelists and our moderator. And. Um, uh, once again, the tribute to Tony Chen and 40th anniversary of uh, Asian, Asian 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 is November 15th from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock right here. Uh, RSVP on Eventbrite, on, and you can find out more details at the U of T East Asian Library website. Um, and before th we start eating, um, <laughs> I'd just like you to know uh, we're going to take about a 10 minute break and then uh, come back here and then uh, we'll have a few readings. Uh, that will start. Um, and I just wanted to mention that I'd like to thank everyone once again for being here. And um, one of the things I do for Rice Paper is I interview very prominent actors, artists, and writers in the community. And although it's great that Asian voices are slowly coming out, um, I was very disappointed to learn that a prominent Asian actor was telling me he won all these awards, but he's still not getting roles. He's still like generic Asian person number three whenever he gets offers. So I think there's still a lot of work to do in activism, and I think it's been very inspiring to listen to everyone talk today. And I hope that when you go home, maybe think about, you know, what are some of the things that maybe you can do? It could be a small part, but that's fine. I think if we all do a little bit, that eventually um, more Asian Canadians will become part of mainstream. Um, and hopefully will be more prominent. Um, I think it's still a very new thing. I mean, we have ancestors, etc. But I mean, I think the newer generations, we also have to lay a road like that, you know, the historically Asian activism has laid for us. But if we don't do anything, then we're just starting again over and over and over. So there's no point. Uh, the road's already been there. So I think we should keep going. And uh, let's have a break. And um, thank you very much. Um, it's always nice to have like an intimate audience for poetry, don't you think? Um, I'm glad I, I feel that way because the audience is steadily becoming more intimate by the moment, which I get. Um, let's see. These are from my first collection, A Place Called No Homeland. Mm. And this is a poem called What the Moon Saw. When I was in grade five, I learned in school that the shadows on the moon are really craters formed by the impact of meteorites pulled in by gravity, lakes and valleys on the face of the moon, scars left by an invisible force. My mother had three long scars on her face, the shape and color of the crescent moon. 
I thought they were beautiful. Liked to sit in her lap and trace them with my fingertips until I got too old for such things. Too old to sit on my mother's lap. Too old to touch my mother's face. Old enough for desire to rise and swell. Glowing pearlescent beneath my skin. Singing, I want, I want, I want to be touched, kissed, tasted, told. You drive me crazy. The sound of Baba's face against, fist against my face. If you want to be my son. Sound of knuckles against bone. Like a meteorite striking the surface of the moon. If you want to live in my house. The sound of his hand whispering through the air. In the lines on his hand, ancient and full of grace. I saw all the love, the terror, the bitterness and rage. And love once again in my father's heart. The shadow shapes, the story echoes that bound us to each other and a place across the sea I'd never seen. The only inheritance we would share. Sound of his hand meeting mine. Sound of his own rage. My heartbeat thundering murder and love in my ears, my mother leaping to her feet. If you touch him again, Ayit, I'll kill you. Scars burning like fire across her face, and our house fell silent, frozen in time, quiet as the lakes of the moon. I want you to see, to listen between the lines, to notice not only the four letters that set love and violence apart, but also the four they have in common. See my history, the lines on my face. There is more to us than we can say. An invisible thread, a force of gravity, a storyline binding us all together. My father, his fist, my mother, the scar, me, and the moon, and you, my love, and you. made. They made me like God. They said, let there be light. And there was. They said, let there be desire. And there was. And they said, let there be shame. And there was. They made me from dust and from dirt, from the shameful soil of the ugly earth I was made. They said, come forth. And obedient as dust I appeared, stretched skinned and raw boned, heart a skinny offering, hungry as shadow and silent as worship I came to serve in silence and leave the same I was made in bathrooms and back rooms, in alleyways and empty stairwells. They made me from the drop of their sweat and trickle of blood as they bit down on my lips. From the trickle, trickle of fingers as they scraped my ribs, they made me. In the dark, in their image, they made me, but smaller. Smaller fingers, smaller eyes, smaller asshole, smaller cock. The better to be fucked with, my dear. Fucking was the secret. Fucking is the word. Fucking is like the word of God. Fucking more than breathing, more than seeing, more than Facebook makes you real. In the darkness that was before fucking, nothing wanted to be made real. Because nothing wasn't enough of anything to be something. Nothing spoke no language. Nothing did not know touch. Nothing had no hair on its chest, no blue in its eyes, no gold in its hair or light in its skin. Nothing was not in fashion magazines or on the radio. Nothing was not televised. Nothing was not the revolution. Nothing was not even close. So nothing took its skinny heart to the rain-soaked streets. Nothing took its shaking, bosh, danced its shaking body to a quivering beat. Nothing whirled and twirled and clicked its heels and drank Jagger bombs that it discreetly vomited a few minutes later and wanted and wished and made silly promises to the reckless universe so that when they came asking for obedience, nothing said yes, 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 yes to the light and the darkness and desire. Yes to being born. Yes to blowjobs for nothing at three in the morning. Yes to dirty talk. Dirty like the soiled and rotten earth. Yes to come here, bitch, and suck it, bitch. And you like that, bitch? Yes to intimacy. Yes to the possibility of lo being loved. Yes to the hand on the thigh crawling up and under. Yes to being slapped in the face. Yes, I'll be a bottom. Yes, I'll be your bitch. Yes, your cock is huge. Put it up my ass. Yes, it's fine without a condom. Yes, fuck me. Fuck me. Fuck me till I bleed. Yes to fisting. Yes to being born. Yes, I'm fine. No need to feel guilty for the bruises. Yes, I like it. Yes, I love you. Yes to touch. Yes, I want to be sexy. Yes, I want to be happy. Yes, I want to come. Yes, 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 I said yes. Yes to the light bringer. Yes to filth. Yes to the apple. Yes to Eve. Yes to pain and to shame and to wondering and to crawling home half naked, reeking of weed. Yes, make me fuckable. Yes, make me real. Yes, yes, I want it. Yes, I said yes. They made me. One more. Um, trying to go for happy now. Uh, okay. Uh, 
thank you for putting up with this. Um, these poems were written uh, like at a, time, at a very angry time in my life um, when I was doing survival sex work in Montreal, the earlier ones, that is. Um, and it was difficult. It was a difficult time. Um, so let, let's see. OK, what about poetry? Because this is literation, right? What about poetry? Book fetish. For the past three weeks, I've carried a copy of Amber Dawn's memoir, How Poetry Saved My Life, in my purse. It's a slender volume, fits nicely, tucked alongside the eyeliner, compact mirror, switchblade, cell phone, lipstick, my femme talismans, my woman's tools. I take it with me everywhere, on the metro, to pour over while call ignoring the cat collars, to pay what you can, queer dance parties, to glance at while hiding in the bathroom from bad exes to school, where the nice white ladies who are my classmates in the social work department are curious to know what I'm reading, and then they say, oh, politely when I tell them, it's a lesbian sex worker's autobiography, how interesting, is it for research? Yes, of a kind. I am researching queer history, femme future. I am researching my own survival. My thesis is my life. Amber Dawn says, lying is the work of those who've been taught that their truths have no value. Reading that one line makes me want to slide between the book's covers, cry myself to sleep. I've always needed books. The way some of my punk queer friends need cigarettes or weed or clear packets of Molly the size of a thumbnail. Without them, I get fidgety, anxious, start to sweat, can't have a good time, can't get down, can't see the point of paying rent or going to work or having sex. I hoard my books, hide them in unconventional places, in the underwear drawer, the crisper of the fridge, a leftover reflex from childhood. When my parents would take them away to punish me or my sister would rip them up just to see me cry. That worked better than hitting, they said, because I cared more about my books than I cared about my body. I learned from this that the best way to control someone you love is to make is to hold threaten the things they hold dearest to take away the things that make them free when i was 16 i discovered queer poetry poems about boys becoming girls about boys desiring boys girls fucking girls and everything in between i knew immediately that i needed these poems to change my life to make my escape to become somebody different i needed these poems but they came printed in books i couldn't afford since i was never allowed to have a job or keep any money this is how i learned to steal books paperbacks are easiest especially thin ones you can roll them up and put them in your sleeve or your waistband but no one suspects a cute little asian girl like me of shoplifting anyway do they if i was black or brown this would be a very different story i stole the books i wanted like a rat stealing the blue eggs from a robin's nest. I stole Gloria Anzaldúa and Audre Lorde and June Jordan and Michael Andache and Ellen Ginsberg and Maya Angelou. I stole them because I loved them. Or at least that's what I said. I could have borrowed them from the library too, but that wasn't enough. <laughs> I needed to own the things that I loved. Someday, I'm going to put every single book I own into a big wooden chest, from slim paperback volumes to hardcover bricks, I'm going to drag them all out to the roof of the highest skyscraper I can break into. The books will be taken aback at first by all that expanse of open blue. They'll have grown accustomed to the dark insides of my jealous custodianship, to being tucked inside purses and slipped inside pillowcases, crammed into refrigerator crispers. <coughs> but slowly, little by little, they'll start to flutter their pages. They'll catch the wind beneath their covers. They'll soar off into the sky. I'll wave goodbye and whisper, I'm sorry. And because they are wise, I think they'll forgive me. Thank you. Such an honor to be here. Should have said that on the mic. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And then we have another reading by Shani. She'll be reading us some of her new works. Could you read my work, please? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic, thank you. Thank you. So uh, the first one I, I will read, these are uh, unpublished. This is what I've been working on for the last little while. Um, this is called Fisting the Earth. And it's uh, written in three parts. Uh, on the Tully's screen, flames arc, oranging, oranging the Arctic sky. Nature's in trouble, so we carry cloth bags to the store and whisper something promising about carbon footprints and offsetting. But need in this story is the unreliable narrator. In the country, one needs a car. In the kitchen, one needs a dishwasher. 12 million coffee pods a year, ending up where? 
fossils fuel the generators that run turbines, that generate electricity, that fuels my air conditioner, that keeps me alive in the rolling heat waves that are the result of burning oil and coal and gas, that fuel generators that run refrigeration, that keeps me alive in the rolling heat waves that are the result of burning fossils. Two. In my dreams, swim fish, uh, swim fish full of plastics and antibiotics, eddies of fire twirl and swirl, fire on stilts, fire pens score, fire graffiti on the sides of mountains. People are evacuated while houses burn, and animals' cries cannot be heard. The permafrost is melting, and basements flood. Abstention from cow product consumption is a joke. 7.6 billion of us and counting. There's mold in the carpet, and five-year-olds are taught to use a gun, making us all comrades in larm. According to the telly, everything's collapsing. Then turn it off, one might say. But you keep watching, because you don't want to miss how it ends. In 2017, 15,549 people were killed by guns in the US. Sorry, there's nothing poetic about that. Three, and just like that, this moment is already gone, the past, the nowness of now, reinterpreting yesterday, or simply forgetting. Fly everywhere, fast. This might be our last hurrah. The weight of us plus time equals this global incineration. That was for Joy, Kogawa. <laughs> and so is the next one, and the one after that. So this is what, this is what um, really preoccupies me right now. It's uh, what's, what's happening with this earth that I, too, am like, just really crazy about. Mm -hmm. This one is called Memoir Number no. 3, and it's written in... Uh, Five parts. One, post-university days consciousness awakening, I joined the we. We the margin, we the people, we the community. We, we imagined, were an avant-garde. The first to be rattled so, spot hidden signs, nuances highlighted. We alone knew, we alone could contemplate articulate, eradicate, stimulate. We marched, pumped fists, stood at the podium, spoke truth to center, waved declarations, attached our signature, refused excesses and excuses, rode bicycles and carried cloth bags to the co-op. Those were the days, my friend, when we dug in our heels, leaned our backs against the monstr monstrous weight of our margin, and we shoved and we shoved until we tore the house down, or so we thought. Those were the days of believing, my friend, in exploration, experimentation. The struggle was a grail. Success met was sus success suspect. Failure was but gasoline. In those days, now was now a slap of the open palm on the table's cold hard top. We tattooed our noble claims upon the breathing skin of sea, on the sides of canyon walls, the price of water and of air, of jungles and rhinos, tusks and ramps and railings. Who's allowed to speak for whom, who dares and dares not, and who teaches what and where? And finally, so we believed, into the garbage pails, gender, race, and sexuality. Two. All the while, our backs were to the horizon's thin line, an unfathomable distance. If we'd ever cared to look, we saw nothing there but haze, fields unsown, horizon unknown, not yet beckoning. Time was not a line, not a circle, but a knot. The past was the pan-seared side of a moment, a halfway mark, an endless thread unspooling. Slight of fist flipped, the future in the open palm, a canvas on which it lay raw and coiled, a bead of water <coughs> trembling under sunlight's equivocal kiss. Busy shouting, clapping, etching, sculpting, eggs that appeared to be hatching, 
We didn't see the future's face, the terror, the gasping. Three, now, nine years short of twice the middle of my years, I remember when, a damning phrase, memories of the flowers wilted now we'd planted, that pile of rubble of the monuments we erected. Perhaps winter is the future, for these days winter is always coming. Four, oh, Mr. Street Corner Evangelist, it's too late for repentance, the fraying future is at hand, Neo-Nazis rising, gay rights trampled by your religious freedom, super typhoons, fianados, and rising sea levels, and the margin remains solidly where it always was. In the second decade of the 21st century, two lesbians in Malaysia are publicly caned, and the Kenyan president says gay rights are of no, no importance. Police officers and lifeguards in Canada and in the US allegedly covertly perform white supremacist hand gestures. In Japan and Norway, pregnant whales are slaughtered. These days, genocide of minorities occurs regularly and with impunity. Oh, come on, stop, stop, stop. There's no poetry here. OK, how about this? Billionaire philanthropists say investments in healthcare and education in developing countries have made a difference. Neonatal mortality rates in Ethiopia, for instance, have dropped and teachers in remote villages now have credentials, are trained too to spot and help students short on potentials. So nowadays, no child need be left behind. Equipped they are with billionaire donated essentials. So yeah, sure. There's good spinning around and round. But by the way, did you know the number of blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans in the tech sector is declining? And Asians are the most likely to be hired, but not promoted. The current trend towards nativism and inwardness? Damn straight, there's no poetry here. Five, charity and change unravel slow, and time is running out. The margins are where they always were, and that's all that's sure. Every moment is always already past. Sand pail and bathing suits still in hand, waiting still at the back door. Clearly, no one's yet said it right. It all bears being said again, even if it's all a recycling. Sometimes I think those, you know, those are the, the corner, um, the people, the people who stand at the corner and they wave those uh, repentance signs, repent now, the end is near. Mm -hmm. And you used to think that they were mad. I don't know. I think I sound like them. <laughs> OK, the last one I'll read is called Send All Possible Answers. We have questions to match. And it is as grave. Sorry. One. I should like to meet my very first parents. I don't mean the South or the broadly East Asians. And no, not the 16th and 17th century great grands, who apparently hail from Japan, Yakut, and Mongolia, nor the one that renders me 0.4% Native American, and not the 4% are from the Neander Valley, but the very first, the pre primal, pre helixed, the unhelixified one. No, not that thumping, contracting, expanding amoeba, but rather the atom whose organs include proton, electron, neutron, ess essence primal, initi initiator of all, material or imagined. I would like, like an amazable god, to have witnessed the crocheting of seven billion, billion, billion ha-has. Ladder of sequence and consequence, pathways entwined, a map unfolding towards this hair five foot four, a rung on evolution's thoroughfare to the ad infinitum. Mundane, yet reliable, as a night parenthesizing day. And, or oh, should that be but, then what? Two. Ice, some say, is the coming skin of the earth. Others insist we're made in the specific likeness of a supposed god, so evolving isn't an option. Once upon an atom time, we were so elegant. 
Now we engineer our own demise, employ technical skins against deadening cold and winds that kill, fire seasons extended, coastal waters ascending. Not all we, but those who can afford, afford and afford technology, zip up their shiny skins, pop a synthetic and expect to endure, forgetting the castles we ourselves have built nuclear, biological, and chemical weaponry, decline in bee and bat biodiversity, pandemics bioengineered, guns and bumps, bump stocks, climate change, robotics. Oh, <coughs> one more thing. Aware of consequences, we nevertheless quench our insatiable appetite for the real thing. Antlers, bear bladders, tiger bones, rhino horns, tusks, tails, livers, kidneys, pelts, feathers, claws. Three, were I phytoplankton, marine magician, converter of light and liquid air, supreme preserver of oxygen, benefactor of environments, not its own? Were I phytoplankton, zooplankton's share, sacrificial of shrimp, baleen, duck, and jellyfish? Were I phytoplankton, excitable fluorescence, shape-shifting aquatic constellation? I might cop center stage now and long beyond the notion of after. Four, no precision or gospel for this <coughs> recreant. No God, no moment of, oh God, here. Purpose, devotion, mission, high-minded and charlatanical, charlatanical subterfuge of the sheeple by the sheeple, supposedly for the sheeple. No God to praise. No God to praise or blame for magnificent accidents of consequence. Sorry, there's just us. I believe in the almighty accident, creator of all universe and beyond, stars, sun, heat, gravity, and velocity, orchid, lava, golden bone, the basic instinctual will of lust, full molecules, to gyrate, tremble, whirl, resolve, to multiply like bunnies and Winston Churchill's Indians, to distort, modify, adapt, and habituate, to compete, or should that be thrive, against, or should that be in, ever morphing environs. Admittedly, if there's to be no God, no moment of, oh God, where are the broken lines along which to tear, the lines to not cross? Five, this brain, this mind, fingers, toes, blood and heart, music in the veins and photographs, the birds at the beating heartland of me, caretaker of those birds. Were it not for her and them, then what of this haphazard crush and entwine of atom at all? One of us may die first and the other will come to know what she'd long ago intuited that love to is subterfuge. The lies we tend, we harness to produce meaning. Six, let skin, heart, lung, stomach, liver, kidney, intestines, brain of every brand and manner of living thing embrace cancer, drought, earthquake, frostbite, hunger, hurricane. Boy, I really sound like one of those people on the corner. <laughs> Hypothermia, pandemic, pestilence, sinkhole, tsunami, volcano. We could, of course, do something. God damn it, do something fast. But the person whose profits will be eaten into will have to have a heart. In any case, that's how the crumbling of the cookie got its start. The castles we built imprisoned and are now falling. But how smart we once were to have tapped gas, laid down pipelines, siphoned it into our homes and kept, they'll at least say this of us, those home fires burning. Okay, enough, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. And with Shani's reading, this concludes our first ever Literation Toronto. And uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next year, and uh, hopefully it'll be an annual event in Toronto, and this will give a chance for more Asian Canadian authors to have a forum to speak. And uh, once again, uh, thank you. And there's books at the back. And um, come back next week. 
because Chuck will be back uh, for the Literation 40th Anniversary and Tribute to Tony Chan. Find everything on the East Library, East Asian Library website. They have everything, okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>